Hello, I'm Casey Aiken, and this is 21 This Week. Coming up next, the Supreme Court's decision overturning Roe v. Wade has had profound effect on the country. What impact will it have here in Maryland? Will the Maryland gun regulation loosen after Supreme Court strikes down a New York concealed carry law? And voting in primary elections are only weeks away. Whom did the Baltimore Sun endorse? Our panel of insiders will give you the story behind the story. We're joined by former County Council member Nancy Florine and Secretary of the Maryland Republican Central Committee, Mark Gunkerford. Stay tuned for these stories and more on the next 21 This Week. The 6-3 Supreme Court decision in Dobbs versus Jackson's Women's Health Organization has rocked the nation. Whether one celebrates the decision or if one believes, as does County Executive Mark Elrich, that this is a dark day for our country. Nancy, President Biden said that it's a sad day for the court and for the country. Today, the Supreme Court expressly took away a constitutional right from American people that, had, that it had already recognized. What's your reaction to this momentous decision? Well, I suppose the good news is that we knew it was coming. So uh, I think we're, as a community, prepared for this. It's, you know, it's disappointing. I mean, this is a big, a really big week for the court. They've uh, toppled a variety of assumptions about our community. Uh, but the right to abortion issue, of course, is, is they've not eliminated the controversy. They've just increased it. And uh, I suppose the good news I heard is that um, all the appointments for vasectomies have been taken up in Arkansas. Uh, but, uh, you know, it is, it's disappointing. I think it's going to force people to take more responsibility for themselves if that actually is the issue. I don't, you know, I never viewed abortion as something that anyone wanted to do. It's a last minute decision when everything else fails. And so to take that away from people uh, is gonna be a problem. And it's not gonna eliminate abortion. I don't know who, what they're smoking. People are just gonna go elsewhere. And so it's a, it's a sad situation. Look, I was, I was what, 22 when Roe v. Wade was decided. I knew lots of people who went to different states for abortions. They didn't plan to get pregnant. They didn't just weren't in a situation to afford to be a parent. Now that world hasn't changed that much. And so, you know, abortions are gonna continue. Let's hope they're not done in back rooms. Uh, let's hope that they, if they have to be done, they're done safely. Maybe more people will get disectomies and contraceptive use will increase. I hope that's true always, uh, but it, it, it is a disappointment to people. I, I have to agree, say, you know, what's also interesting, if you look at Clarence Thomas's uh, concurring opinion, the whole issue of personal privacy is on the table. I don't think there's any question about that, regardless of what the other justices say. So, you know, I think changes are coming. Well, uh, none of the other justices signed, signed out of that concurrence, Nancy. So there's, yeah, there, we, have to wait, we have to wait and see. Mark, in the majority opinion, Justice Alito seemed to have three central theses. First, that, that the inescapable conclusion is that the right to abortion is not deeply rooted in the nation's history, tradition, or the Constitution. Second, that the supporters of Roe v. Wade ignored the life question and instead imposed on all states the same arbitrary point late in pregnancy when a fetus has the most basic human rights to live. And third, that it's time to heed the Constitution and return the issue of abortion to the people's elected representatives concluding that the Constitution does not prevent the citizens of each state from regulating or permitting or prohibiting abortions. What's your reaction? Well, I think the third point is, is perhaps of those uh, three, the most important, which is that abortion is being going to, going forward, be treated as a political question. Uh, one where elected officials in the various states and potentially federal government, but in the various states, uh, will decide what the rules are. And that will mean that uh, we will have a variety of, of different uh, uh, statues around the country. I think one of the problems with the fact that for the last 50 years, this has been subject to the courts is that the consensus that might have uh, emerged about 
what are very difficult is, as Nancy mentioned, very difficult sets of choices, the balance of, of the rights of a mother or a woman and, and those of, of, of fetus. Um, we've never been able to resolve that because we had the courts kind of to look to to be the arbiter. Uh, I think there's much more of a consensus and, and I think that that will evolve more. That is a consensus between what are sometimes very extreme views on say late term abortion and on um, sort of the efforts on some parts of some people to criminalize um, women who are, who are pregnant and, and, and have a medical procedure. So I, I think that's really what the focus is, is it gives us an opportunity to let our democratic representatives do what they do best and, and work these problems out. So Nancy, when, when the draft opinion was, was leaked about eight weeks ago, we noted on, on the, this program at the time that Maryland had legalized abortion up to the point of viability back as far back as 1992 when there was a ballot initiative. And it was, it was suggested that viability is around 24 weeks. Well, that was the crux of the Dobbs case and other cases, which are so the so-called fetal heartbeat cases, where they now believe that viability is around 15 weeks. So are we going to see any change in the Maryland law as a consequence of Dobbs? I don't know. Uh, I suppose uh, there might be an effort to uh, eliminate uh, viability uh, standards altogether. Uh, you know, I think Maryland would only go further, I think, to extend the right than anybody, than many places. Uh, so I think that's the only likelihood, and I'm not sure that, you know, people are going to have the gumption for it. No, no, they probably will, uh, just to make this, this statement. But that would have to go through a whole, uh, whole, uh, a uh, whole constitutional amendment process. And that's a big thing and very difficult uh, to do. Costly takes a long time. And, you know, we shall see. I think that's possible. I think pe people in Maryland are pretty comfortable with the existing rules and are, you know, glad they live here uh, compared to some of the other states. Remember the Mississippi case uh, addressed were established vi viability at 15 weeks, I think, 15 weeks, something like that. They, but they agreed that it was otherwise permissible. And, you know, the question is, uh, are some states are going to go and take away that option altogether? They're doing it now. Uh, and others will, you know, it's going to be a mishmash, which just makes it more complicated for, for people in the situation that they find themselves in to figure out what the right solution is and where they have to go. You know, so, so yeah, I don't know. It's going to be a mess. No Mark, about that. Let's talk about the political ramifications. You know, some of the early polls that have come out suggest that inflation and the cost of living is still more important than abortion. So are we going to see what's the impact of Dobbs next next November? I think the political impact uh, may not be as as evident this year, uh, but I do kind of caution that, uh, again, as I referenced this uh, consensus process is kind of pulling together with a, a variety of different views. Uh, I think outliers uh, in from both sides will be punished down the road if, if people don't try and find a common ground in individual states. Mm -hmm. So um, we're going to go on to on to our next topic, but it's also you know focused still on on the actions of the Supreme Court. As Nancy said, there have been significant decisions this past ten days. And the Supreme Court handed down a, a several important decisions, many of which will have impact on, on Maryland. But one of the most important is the New York case involving concealed handgun uh, permits. Nancy, Maryland delegate Leslie Lopez called the decision shameful in the, in the New York case when the vast majority of Americans are seeking more common sense guns ref, gun reform. New York struck down the law because of its subjectivity. Well, yeah, uh, and the Maryland, uh, Maryland was cited by the Supremes as one of the states that had very similar language. And it's, it's, it is, it's very similar to New York's, if not word for word. So, you know, as a citizen who doesn't believe in owning a gun, I'm rather terrified. Uh, does this mean that, you know, people are gonna be, feel that they are empowered to hold a gun uh, in their outside pocket when, when they're at the Safeway? Uh, 
query how this is going to fall out, but it's really rather terrifying. I saw just uh, before we started this conversation that someone is suing Metro, a couple of people suing Metro over the, over the uh, prohibition of, of uh, carrying a gun on the Metro station and through the Metro system. So we're going to see more and more of that. And, uh, you know, reasonable uh, limitation seems to be, a pro I thought there was agreement on that subject. Uh, but for this to be, you know, thrown out is is really a, a matter of concern, at least for me personally. I think uh, the Supreme Court already decided that there were very few limitations, uh, and and they actually ignore the the language of the Constitution that refers to a well regulated militia. Somehow that has nothing to do uh, with a, a right to carry firearms. So we'll, we'll see how this goes. There's great debate around that that phrase. Yeah, uh, well, it's... And, and there will continue to be. Yeah. I want to ask Mark, though, uh, Mark, the New York law, which was almost identical to the Maryland statute, was struck down again, as I mentioned, because of its subjectivity as to whether an individual had, quote, a need and to demonstrate a need to carry a firearm. But they also suggested that there are certain limitations to this. But will there be a change in Maryland law or are we going to see more litigation on this? It's interesting. I, I had not realized that New York and Maryland's law were so similar. Um, yeah. I, I take that. I, I will tell you that in operation, this, having lived in New York, that in operation, the Sullivan law, which is the New York law, um, again, emphasizing in operation, made it very, very difficult for people who had legitimate, re, you know, real reasons to be afraid and were seeking to have a firearm, prevented them from having it. And it also made it a very politicalized process because those people tended to have, you know, the appropriate, uh, at least in operation, uh, Maryland is better. I will tell you that there, it's shell carry and, you know, must issue. I mean, there are, there are, there's plenty of contention about that, but uh, in operation, the Sullivan and I in New York was particularly egregious. Uh, I think what this forces is jurisdictions like Maryland is to, if they're going to have a review process, it has to be more legitimate. And uh, if if people are denied a firearm and, and there is the process allows for that, um, there really has to be more of a basis uh, for for uh, for doing that. Well, I want to I want to also turn to one of the key Supreme Court decisions that came down on June thirtieth. Uh, the last day of the court, which which was the uh, case of West Virginia versus EPA, and the decision was to restrict the EPA's ability to regulate certain parts of the Clean Air Act, and specifically, and this I think is in keeping with some of the other decisions that the court made, wants wanted to read the narrow standards and statute of the statutes, and said that th that Congress hadn't uh, given the EPA uh, specific legislative authority over these matters, and that the EPA therefore did not have the ability to do that. Nancy, why don't you comment on that first, and then we'll go to Mark. Well, some people are calling this the end of administrative law. I don't think that's the case at all. Uh, I, I, in reading the opinion, as far as I could tell, uh, the issue was uh, the uh, uh, ability of the EPA to regulate beyond so-called systems, which I think would be defined as like a plant, a system of connected things. And what the what EPA had done was to go beyond uh, limiting the system per se, but saying, I think you had to shut down or you had to do something else. Uh, you had to invest in something else to address emissions. Uh, and I think so they were looking at more creative ways to address the emissions problem. And, and you know they have been um, called out for that. I don't think it precludes their ability to regulate, but some of the more creative solutions that people have come up with so far, I think will have to be legislated as opposed to viewed as implicit within the range of their authority. That's always an issue with administrative decision-making and regulatory action, what is implicit within the authority of the of the regulation, I, I, uh, but I think it's kind of narrow. I uh, so, well, as you as you correctly point out, they didn't throw out the Chevron decision, which no. would have which would have thrown our entire administrative process in uh, to entire disarray. They narrowed the focus. So, Mark, 
what is your view of what the uh, the court did with respect to this decision? Well, it, it, you just sort of referenced the point that I was going to be make is that the court has been telegraphing for quite some time that uh, the Chevron deference, the deference that courts uh, uh, give to regulatory agency in, in the decisions they make, sort of assuming that they basically write unless there's a very compelling reason to believe that they didn't. Um, the, the indications has been that, that the courts tended to chip away with that. And so this is very much a, a, a step in that direction. Uh, I, you know, down the road, given the direction of the precedents in this area, I would expect that there's going to be more uh, where the courts will expect that the, that the legislatures give clear authority to regulatory agencies and that regulatory agencies can't move beyond what their uh, authority is. Thank you, Mark. The one we didn't have time to talk about the, um, the Supreme Court's decision in the main tuition case, but I would think that most creative legislators would look at that and want to start pushing for a voucher system here in Maryland so as to give uh, the ability yeah. for people. Well, think about it, Nancy. It's uh, you're, we're not getting any charter schools. We might they have to start thinking about creatively about something else. When we come back from this short break, <laughs> primary election day is fast approaching. And who received the endorsement from the Baltimore Sun? Stay tuned. And welcome back. With so many candidates receiving endorsements, we're going to need to move quickly, selectively, and as I said, rapidly. Uh, Nancy, Tom Perez received the endorsement from the Baltimore Sun, but will this help his campaign, which according to most polls is lagging behind Peter Francho and Wes Moore? Well, he also got the post. I mean, uh, we'll see. Uh, who reads these papers? That's the question. How do you get the word out? I mean, this is a real big issue. Uh, certainly when I was first running for office, it was a big thing. I think it's a, a less of a thing now because people uh, get access to media in a variety of different ways. Well, so you just yeah, stole, it's hard you to just get that the exit question, Nancy. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. Mark, Mark um, Former Secretary of Labor Kelly Schultz received the endorsement of the Sun and her former boss, Governor Larry Hogan. Now there are reports that the Democratic Congressional Committee just made a $1 million ad buy for her opponent, State Delegate Dan Cox. Which is more important, the Sun's endorsement or money? I, I, I hate to say it. I think that this intervention, this is this has happened in a number of different states, and it's frankly happened with different mixed results, but uh, it's unfortunate when one party uh, essentially decides to jump into another party's primary in an effort to foreclose the choice that uh, people are going to have. Um, and it, we'll see. Um, I doubt the Sun's endorsement is, I, I, as much as I like Kelly, the fact the Sun and the Post have endorsed her probably doesn't help her as much as uh, a lot of television. Well, there's a headline in, in today's Baltimore Sun on this very topic today. Right. And I'm, you know, I think it's good that it comes out. We right. saw in Colorado that it didn't have any effect, but we did see in Pennsylvania and in Illinois where it did. So um, this is a, a topic that's fraught with danger. Yeah, you know, nobody knows. If you win, you'll say it made a difference. And if you didn't win, you know, it didn't, didn't help. So, I mean, it, I, I, these days endorsements of any sort I think are a roll of the dice to begin with. And Robert, uh, you love them, don't you? You gotta love them. <laughs> well, I, I love the ones I've got I've gotten, uh, the ones I haven't gotten, and there are plenty of those. I uh, didn't matter. Uh, right, but well, they matter to other people, you know. Let's go on to the, the last race <laughs> we're gonna talk about, and that's the attorney general race where retired uh, district court judge Katie Curran O'Malley, we got to get that full, you know. Uh, name in there for name recognition. And 21 this week panelist, Jim Shalek, received the nod from the Baltimore Sun. Now I'm going to ask you both, are these good choices? Start with you, Nancy. Yeah. I mean, they're good choices. I'm not, I mean, down in Montgomery County, the Baltimore Sun doesn't stand for a lot here. I don't know if uh, the Post endorsed her or not. Uh, but yeah, these are, uh, these are, Jim and Katie are good choices for the general election. Absolutely. Mark. Well, Jim Shalek did get uh, the Republican endorsement uh, from the Washington Post. So he's a, 
uh, he, he's, he, as he has gotten a variety of other ones as well. Uh, so uh, he's probably uh, led the field, at least in terms of endorsements in the Republican primary. And he is absolutely an excellent choice for attorney general. So um, we, we would be, we would be uh, fortunate to have him on the ballot in, in November. You know, his campaign is, is interesting because he said that his focus, unlike past attorney generals, he's going to create a crime task force division in the attorney general's office to help um, prosecute serious crime in Baltimore and in other regions of the, of the state that are undermanned right. with prosecutors. So his background as a criminal prosecutor in New York really is evident in the, in the campaign that he's running. So exit question for you both. And Nancy blew it at the, at the beginning. So who cares about the Washington Post or the Baltimore Sun issue these endorsements? Because uh, has everybody abandoned print media or are they do have some uh, merit? Real quick, we have 30 seconds each. Uh, I heard a disturbing thing yesterday from a person of color who said that for this person, endorsement of the post uh, for a black person was not a positive thing and that it was viewed negatively in the black community. And I said, really? He said, yes. So I have to say these things work both ways. Mark. I, I would cert I certainly agree with that, uh, but in, and maybe a, a slightly wonkier a, a response too, is I think at the top of the ticket, uh, top races like governor, people tend to make up their own mind because they you know, pay more attention. Uh, it, when races where people are maybe not as familiar with the candidates and school board, for example, where they kind of, it's hard to find out yeah. th that much information, uh, the, uh, endorsements, I think, are that much more uh, influential. Well, we'll have to wrap it up there. Just remember, vote early, vote often, and vote for Aiken. Uh, when we come back, <laughs> parting shots. Welcome back. Now with parting shots, Nancy Florine. Well, this is a big week. Uh, early voting uh, begins on Thursday, July 7th, and it runs through the 14th. Uh, polls are open at, I, we have, I think, over 14 uh, different locations in Montgomery County. They open at seven and close at eight. And you can find out which one's closest to you at 777vote.org. Uh, uh, and if the, of course, the general is on the 19th. So plenty of time, opportunities to vote. Also voting by mail. I already voted two weeks ago. Uh, I think there are over 50 different drop boxes for those that will be available during the early voting time. So folks, don't, don't miss this. This is really important. Thank you, Nancy. Mark Conkofer, your parting shot. Well, let me just echo what uh, Nancy just said, but uh, perhaps elaborate it a, a little. Um, you know, there's a huge drop off, a uh, substantial drop off where most eligible voters choose not to vote in primaries, even if they've registered in one of the two parties. Uh, and that's really unfortunate because the selection of the candidates really determines what you obviously, who you can vote for in November and uh, frequently in, in some jurisdictions can determine who's gonna be elected in advance of November. Um, so avail yourself of the opportunity to uh, come out and vote in the primary. Uh, we have very, very tight primaries for governor in both the Republican and uh, Democratic parties. Uh, and so, and obviously we have here in, in uh, primaries for county executive in, uh, in uh, Montgomery County. So take advantage, come out and vote. Thank you, uh, Mark. And thank you, Nancy. I hope everyone uh, has a wonderful 4th of July weekend. It's a wonderful time to celebrate our nation's history. Um, and I hope you get out and enjoy that with your family and your friends. And I wanna thank, thank you both for participating. I also wanna thank the audience for tuning in each and every week to Montgomery County's hardest hitting political talk show. For 21 this week, I'm Casey Aiken.